Jim Candy, Part 3, Chapter 11. A couple of days later, just after Coach Carlson had left the weight room to do his custodial work, Drago and Clark slipped inside. Hey, you guys change your minds? You coming back? Brad Middleton asked, a big smile on his face. That was Brad. Matt Drager scowled. No, Middleton, we're not coming back. I wouldn't play for Carlson if he got down on his knees and begged me. So what are you doing here? Drager nodded towards me. I wanted to see just how strong Muscle Boy over there has gotten, taking protein powders and lifting weights every day. I figure he must be a mountain man by now. With that, Drager strode over to where Drew was doing bench presses. How much weight you got on there, Barbell? 120, Drew said. Drager snorted. 120? Put on 180. Then he turned to me. That's the way NFL teams use to see how strong a guy is. Can you press it, or do you need to drink some barf powder first? I can press it, I said. So let's see you do it. With Drager and Clark and the rest of the guys watching, I slid onto the bench. Middleton eased the barbell into my hands. I got a good grip and pushed it straight up. Once, twice, three times. I could feel my face turning red, feel the veins on my forehead and neck filling with blood. My arms were wobbling, but I pushed it up a fourth, a fifth. I might have made it one more, but Middleton snatched the weight away from me. Drigger clapped real slow as I stood, and then he stripped his shirt off. My turn, he said, settling onto the bench. Again, Middleton spotted him. Now the entire team was crowded around. He was older than I was, and he was strong, but he hadn't been in the weight room once that winter. I expected he might match me or even beat me by a couple of reps, but he pumped 185 pounds the way I pumped 120. He did five reps in about five seconds. He flew right through 10. He slowed a little at 15. When he stopped at 20, everyone knew he had more in him. Middleton took the barbell from Drager, who stood and then wheeled on me, pointing his finger. Still think you'll beat me out, he said, coming toward me so that we were stood nose to nose. What's the matter, you little puke? Got nothing to say? I should have gone for his gut. If I'd hit him in the gut, he'd lurch forward, and I could have followed with a fist to his face, and maybe I'd have had him. But I went for his head because I wanted to hit him so hard he'd go down and stay down. He might have, too, had I connected. But he ducked out of the way, and my punch barely grazed his ear. A second later, Clark grabbed me from behind, pinning my arms against my sides. Then Drager drove his fist into my stomach. The punches came fast and hard like pistons. After what was probably ten seconds but felt like ten minutes, Clark released me. I slid to my knees, both arms covering my gut. Clark kicked me, and when I rolled to my side, Drager spit in my face. See you around, muscle boy, he said, and the two of them walked out. Once they'd left, Deshaun and Drew bent over me. You all right? Drew said, pulling me to my feet. I was almost standing when my knees buckled, but I didn't let myself fall down. Once I was all the way up, I pushed Drew away. I'm okay. You're not okay, Deshaun said, and he took my elbow. I shook free. I'm okay, I choked out. Just leave me alone. Somehow I made it into the bathroom, staggered to a stall, stepped in and slid the steel bar into place, locking it. Then I went down on my knees, this time to throw up. I knew Deshaun and Drew were just outside the door. Go away. I gasped between wretches. Go away. They left, their footsteps echoing on the tile floor. I could have stayed in that toilet stall for an hour, but they were still waiting for me, Deshaun and Drew and the rest of them. I forced myself to stand. I forced myself out of the stall. I forced myself to wash up even though my ribs ached each time I raised my hands to my face. When I returned to the weight room, the other guys stopped what they were doing and looked over, but nobody spoke. I walked to the corner where the dumbbells were, picked up the 12-pounders, and made myself do some curls. That burned. Every couple of minutes, I'd catch somebody looking over me. Each time, the guy would look quickly look away. They were my teammates, and they'd stood there and let Drager and Clark beat me. Two against one, and no one had done a thing. After a while, the first guy left, then another guy, and two more, and I zipped up my duffel and headed for the door. I wanted to get into my Jeep and drive off, but Drew hustled to catch up. I'm sorry, Mick, he said. I know I should have done something, but it happened so fast. I thought it was going to be a fair fight, you against Drager. What Clark did was gutless, but I didn't see it coming. Nobody did. And when it happened, I froze. And just when I was going to jump in, that's when Clark let you go. It happened too fast. I looked up at the sky. The wind was pushing black clouds toward us. And that fit, because there was like a black cloud over our friendship, and words weren't going to make it go away. I'm not blaming you, Drew. I finally managed, but I'm blaming me. Well, don't. We'd reached the Wrangler. If anything like this ever happens again, Drew said, I'll be ready. 
I won't stand and watch. Forget about it, I said. That's the best thing. I started the Jeep up, managed a small wave, and drove home. Here we have, in the weight room, right, Nick's been trying to prove himself. Drager, Drager and Clark, who were supposed to have transferred, so why the heck are they still hanging around their old high school, walk in, and they have Nick show them right, how much he can bench press right now, which isn't that much. I mean, it's commendable, but he's still working on it. And then Drager sits down and benches the same thing, but doesn't struggle at all. It seems like he could just keep going forever um, with benching this weight. And so he stands up, Drew's, up, or sorry, Nick's upset at him, tries to punch him and misses. Then Clark grabs Nick's arms so he can't move, and Drager like goes to town like beating on him. And none of Nick's classmates, none of his teammates rather, step in to help him. And he gets a really, really bad beating. He can't really stand up straight, but he doesn't want to show it to the guys. So after recovering from it in the bathroom, comes out, lifts weights like it doesn't hurt him until he can leave. Drew tries to apologize for not standing up for him, saying, hey, like it all happened so fast. Because the book says it was like, what, like 10 seconds or so? Like it happened so fast. Drew was like, I didn't really have time to react. Sorry, I didn't jump in sooner. And you can tell he really means it. He wants to be a good friend for Mick. But I think Mick feels betrayed, and he's going to feel betrayed by this, the fact that not a single one of his teammates stepped in to help him against these two bullies who were not even on their team anymore, so they're not their teammates anymore. And Nick has this betrayal now. Like, he feels like he can't trust anyone and that no one has his back. My ribs were so sore, I didn't return to school for two days. My gut was an ugly yellow-purple from the bruising, and I had trouble eating. I could have stayed home a third day, but by then my mom was suspicious. A 24-hour flu does not last 72 hours, she said. If you don't feel well enough to go to school tomorrow, you're going to the doctors. As I started up the stairs leading to the main entrance of the school, I heard a voice call out, Mick, wait. I turned. It was Kaylee Sullivan. I'd known Kaylee since middle school when we'd done a science project on landforms together, known her and liked her. She is tall with brown hair and brown eyes. She is also an athlete, a sprinter, and a volleyball player. All year I'd seen her around Shills Hole High and said hello every time. And every time she'd smile and say hello back. But we didn't have any classes together, so that was as far as it went. I heard about what Drager and Clark did to you, she said as we walked into the building. They are just animals, two against one like that. Animals and cowards, that's what everybody says. They'd have no friends if they were still here, none at all. What do you mean, if they were still here? I said. She looked confused. They're gone, didn't you know? The day they beat you up, that was their last day. That's why they did it. They knew they could get away with it. But if you told Mr. Z, he'd get them suspended from West Seattle. I shook my head. I'm not telling anybody. I had a feeling you'd say that. I looked at her. Do you think that's wrong? No, I guess not. She paused. Well, I've got to go to math now. See you around. So I apologize. I thought they had already transferred, but apparently the day they beat Mick up was their last day at Shills Hole High before they transferred to West Seattle. Because remember, they can't play football anymore for Shills Hole High. Mr. Carlson doesn't want anything to do with them. So as their la last kind of act of defiance before they transferred, they beat Mick up. And we also find out he has a crush on a girl named Kaylee Sullivan, who is also an athlete. Kaylee wasn't the only person who approached me that day. So did her friends, Natalie Vick and Heather Lee. So did Russ, Russ Diver, a fat guy in my last period class who I'd known since first grade. And so did a kid with green spiky hair who I didn't know at all. It was as if every single person in the school had heard every detail. They were all trying to be nice. They were all saying that two against one wasn't fair, but I didn't want pity. For the rest of the week, I went straight from one class to the next, kept my head down in the hallways, I ate lunch by myself on the steps leading down to the tennis courts, and when the school day ended, I walked straight to the parking lot, hopped in my Jeep, and drove home, skipping weight training. That weekend, my dad had me turn over the soil in a spot behind the shed where my mother grew vegetables. The earth was wet from all the rain, and my arms ached from the work. As I shoveled dirt, my muscles burning, I kept picturing Drager on his back, bench pressing 180 pounds like it was nothing. Then I saw myself straining every muscle, but only managing a fraction of what he'd done. It would have been okay if Drager had been a little stronger than I was. That would have made sense, even. He was older and outweighed me by 15 pounds. 
but Drager was a lot stronger. And I knew there were other running backs on other teams, guys born naturally strong like Drager, but who also worked the weights every day. Drager didn't put in the work, so I could see myself catching up to him. It would take time, but I'd do it. But how could I catch up to guys who were just naturally stronger than I was and who didn't dog it? Monday, I went back to eating lunch with Drew and Deshaun, but nothing felt right. One of them would say something and I'd laugh too hard, and then I'd say something and they'd laugh too hard. After school, I returned to the weight room. Guys nodded to me and said, good to see you, but basically they left me alone. On Tuesday, Nolan Brown came over while I was doing squats. What those guys did sucked, and Drager's no friend of mine, he said. Then he returned to his station. That week I hit the wall. Bench press, squats, curls, you name it, and I was stuck. I looked at the clipboard where I kept track of my personal bests, and I saw that, if anything, I was slipping back. In the hall the next day, I asked Carlson what I should do. He shrugged. Everybody hits a dead spot. Keep working, and you'll get past it. For the next few weeks, I worked and worked, but nothing changed. Around me, the guys were laughing, having a good time. I pretended I was, too. I pretended that the whole thing with Drager was over, over and forgotten. But I kept picturing Drager grinning at me, mocking me. One Friday night, after my third straight miserable week in the weight room, I was up in my bedroom listening to music, my mind working like crazy. I had an alarm set to remind me to drink my final protein shake. It started beeping, and I automatically got up, stepped into my bathroom, and reached for the protein powder. Then I stopped. I looked at that stuff, and I hated it. I thought of the work I was doing to pay for it, the painting, the pruning, and the cleaning. I might as well go back to eating Snickers bars and drinking Coke, because I wasn't getting stronger, then all the sacrifices made no sense. My dream of being a big-time football player, it was just that, a dream. Mick, my dad called from up the stairwell. Do you know where the bucket is? I think it's in the yard, I called down. See if you can find it. Your mom's looking for it. I went downstairs, out the back door, and started across the yard towards the shed. A full moon was shining down. I didn't see the bucket, but in the middle of the lawn I spotted an old football. Without thinking, I picked it up and tucked it tight against my chest. I took a couple of steps as if I were playing, and somehow I wasn't in my backyard in the moonlight anymore. Instead, I was in a big time game under the lights, and tacklers were fighting through blocks, trying to get at me. Everything was confused, cluttered, closed. I had no chance, none. I was going down, but then I made a quick move, and I found some space, and then made a second move. A tackler dived for my ankles, but missed. I cut back. I saw it, an opening. I darted through the hole. A final tackler tried to grab me high, but I shrugged him off, and a split second later was all open in front of me, open and green and empty, and I was running down the field, running and running until I'd run out of space, run through the end zone. I raised the football above my head, then spiked it onto the lawn. It landed just just short of the hedge, took a crazy football bounce, and disappeared under the shrubbery. I stood there, trying to remember why I was out in the yard in the first place. It took a while, but I finally remembered the bucket. So Mick is plateauing in the weight room before, and whether you've ever tried to lose weight before, or maybe you have done something like lifting weights or running or whatnot, at a certain point you plateau. You're doing well for a while, and then your body like just becomes stagnant with whatever you're doing. And that's what's happened with Mick in the weight room. He's been working really hard, but he's become stagnant. And he asks his coach for help, and his coach is just like, oh, just keep trying. You'll eventually get past that zone, and, you know, it'll start working for you again. And so that doesn't really offer Mick much help. And if you've ever had a coach that you've gone to for advice before, and they just say something like that to you, it's not helpful information. Right. Um, so his coach doesn't do much for him. Mick is very discouraged in that area. He's discouraged in his friendships. Yes, he's hanging out with Drew and Deshaun again, but it's kind of forced and awkward because they didn't step in with the incident with Drager. And yet, despite all of that, we have these last few pages at the end of this chapter where Mick goes outside at night and he finds a football in their yard and he has, you know, he's like basically daydreaming right about playing football and we realize he still hasn't lost his love for football despite all that has happened to him.